when I think of risk and resilience for persons with disabilities, first of all, what I feel good about is this issue has been gaining incre increasing importance over the last couple of years, which is great. But what evidence also suggests, and it's growing every day, and as we see, just saw in the video, that whether it's a cyclone or a tsunami or an earthquake or a context of forced displacement, children and adults with disabilities face disproportionate risk and adversity. Existing disparities and inequities heighten the impact of disasters, forced displacement, climate-related events on the most marginalized groups of the population, and children with disabilities are one of the worst impacted. We can have more studies, but it's unlikely to say us something different. But things need to change, and there are critical actions that we need to undertake urgently to bring about this change. Some of these actions are being taken. We have five minutes today to make our statement. So while there are a range of factors which need to be considered and actions which follow from them, I'll touch on three fundamental issues. The first is the involvement and the direct and full involvement of children and adults with disabilities in programs, interventions, planning around risk resilience and humanitarian action. The second is the urgent need to strengthen national data systems so that they are better able to capture the issues faced by children and adults with disabilities. And the third is the critical aspect of accessibility. Whether it's the CRPD, the SDGs, the Sendai framework, or discussions around the WHS last year where I was present, they highlight one or all of these points. Let me start with the most fundamental one, the direct involvement of children and adults with disabilities. Now, who is better able to identify the risk that you face than you yourself. As our friend just pointed out from the floor, children and adults with disabilities are uniquely placed to help identify the risks and be involved in designing solutions for them. We talk about risk-informed planning and decision-making, but that risk is informed by whom? unless we are able to bring about this fundamental understanding and change and operationalize it into our programs when we do a risk analysis or, or, or programming around risk and resilience, we will not go very far. Our experiences show that when we do, it makes a huge difference. Let me give you an example. In Nepal, for example, UNICEF had a partnership with the umbrella organization of persons with disabilities before the earthquake and with several agencies working on children with disabilities. So once the earthquake hit, within the first few days, with the, with the help of the national DPO as well as disability-focused NGOs, we could identify more than 5,000 children with disabilities who could later be linked to programs and services. As a part of the school preparedness program in Nepal itself, UNICEF reached out to schools where children with disabilities were studying, both specific schools for children with disabilities as well as regular schools. And in one of the schools, just to give you an example, after the earthquake, none of the children with disabilities were injured or killed. So it has a positive impact, and we know that, and we cannot do more of it, and this is fundamental. 
Second point is on data. Unless national data systems capture how many children and adults with disabilities they are, where they are, and they're counted, we cannot systematically include persons with disabilities. To be counted, we need to count persons with disabilities. National data systems have to do much, much better. UNICEF, in collaboration with the Washington Group, has developed the Child Functioning Module, Household Survey Data Module. And we hope that this will significantly contribute to strengthening data on persons with disabilities. As we speak, UNICEF is holding a workshop on strengthening data in West Africa, where several national statistical offices and UN partners are right now discussing on how to make how to strengthen data, national data systems on disability. And it's not only household survey data. We need to strengthen administrative data also, education management information systems, and so on. We have piloted guidance on how to, how to strengthen that, and it has been working well. So there are tools available, and they need to be incorporated into, into data systems. The last point is on accessibility. Ladies and gentlemen, accessibility or the lack of it has a direct and a significant bearing on the risk and resilience of persons with disabilities. If you are building a school or a community center and if that is not accessible, when the flood hits or an earthquake happens or a tsunami happens and th those, these facilities are used as evacuation centers, we don't need to be very, very informed and technical to know that persons with disabilities, children and adults will not be able to access these places. If you are building early warning systems which do not take into account accessibility of people, of children who cannot see or hear or communicate effectively, or, or then we cannot expect these early warning systems to work for persons with disabilities. At the same time, we know if we plan accessibility from the design stage, it doesn't cost significantly more. There is evidence which suggests that. At UNICEF, we have incorporated accessibility into our core procurement processes so that systematically we can ensure that accessibility is taken into account, monitored, and implemented, and, and quality assured throughout each stage of the process. We have enough barriers in the world. Let's not spend any resource to create new barriers. Let's spend the resources to create accessible, enabling environments for all. And that, gentle, ladies and gentlemen, will greatly help to reduce risk and build resilience of persons with disabilities. At UNICEF, we remain committed to working with all of you. And with this, I thank you for your attention. And I hand over the floor to the chair. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.